shipping. Let us handle your next print project because when you support our business, you support the community. Call 612-870-0777 or visit mpuptown.com. That's mpuptown.com. We print everything. Greg Bakken here. Like you, I love good, fresh, delicious food. So I want to tell you about this treasure in Roseville called Maverick's Real Roast Beef. Maverick's has the best roast beef sandwiches I've ever had. Made fresh every order. Add fries or onion rings dropped in the fryer when ordered, and you have a winning combination. Maverick's Real Roast Beef has a lot more than roast beef, so check out their website, maverick'sbeef.com, or check out their restaurant on Lexington in Roseville. With your AM 950 weather, I'm Brett Johnson. Look for partly cloudy skies tonight with a low around 7, Thursday sunny with a high near 34, and Friday partly cloudy with a high around 45. Ditch the ordinary. Transform your meals with Vinaigrette's premium oils and vinegars. From extra virgin olive oils to white balsamic vinegars and wine vinegars, they've had you covered since 2009. Family owned and located at 50th and Xerxes. Explore their offerings at vinaigrettemn.com. Elevate your taste with Vinaigrette. Portions of the following program may be pre-recorded. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host, guest, random reptoid, or chupacabra may not necessarily reflect those of AM950 Radio, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Now, it's time to step into the unknown. There are things people experience but never talk about. A shadow moving in the corner, flickering of the lights, a disembodied voice, we invite you to talk with us, share your story, share your experience, because this isn't just your story. This is our story. This is Ghost Box Radio with Greg Bakken. And this is Ghost Box Radio on AM 950, where every night we talk about the paranormal, UFOlogy, Bigfoot, and so much more. My name is Greg Bakken. Thank you very much for joining me on this Wednesday before Easter, which plays a big part in tonight's program. I also have with me tonight, I have in the other room, Adam. How are you tonight? Doing well, sir. Doing well. We are moving towards the Easter holiday, and I could not be more excited for not only the holiday, because I get to grill for the family, but to tonight's guest. Is that the Easter tradition, grilling? It is now. It's happened the last two years, so I've kind of been like, you know what, let's stop the arguments about who's serving where. I got burgers, I got dogs, bring BYOB, bring your own butts, bring your own seats, come on over. Wow. And yet I didn't get an invite. If you want to. No, I, I, I don't, actually. Okay. Well, thanks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, I'm not kidding. Now I'm in a tough spot because I, you know, I don't want to sound rude or anything, but I also don't want to go to your house. Fair, so, you fair, know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I don't want to go there either. So here, you know, uh, tonight uh, I was down in uh, near downtown Minneapolis. I haven't been down there in a long time. It's interesting to see what's still there, what's not there. Mm -hmm. Um and and I was surprised I was able to uh, navigate myself through there. I was out there tonight with my friend Brianna over at Megas, and uh, we were just laughing. We had a good time laughing. We were over at a restaurant. I don't know if you heard of it called Spitz. I've never heard of it before. Neither have I. It's a Mediterranean restaurant, Ooh. and it was it was really really good. So I I enjoyed that quite a bit. I gotta give that one a shot. I love Mediterranean. Oh, food. I had I had a gyro tonight. Uh, it was a chicken one. It was very good. But I mean, uh, what Brianna had and what the other people are getting around us, some really good stuff. Uh, they have a lot of cocktails and stuff as well. So fun time was had and a lot of laughs. It was a good night. Right on. I got to try that place called Spitz. Spitz, S-P-I-T-Z. Well, you know, you, what you mentioned about Mavericks. Oh, my God. Did that you, Philly is amazing. Did you go? Yeah. That Philly is absolutely amazing. Probably one of the best I've had in, God, I would honestly say about 15, 20 years. Well, I'm glad you went. That was that, so good. That was very good. We should still get a, we should still get a ghost box radio uh, group out there one day. Oh, I think we should. That would be and fun. just, just go and, you know, everyone pay for their own, obviously, yeah. but uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got to put the disclaimers in now. We don't want to, we don't want to overpromise anything, you know, we'll, we're not even going to give transportation. Just meet us there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know you're, I know I'm making this sound really good. Uh, so uh, tonight, uh, I, I'm excited about this. I, I really am. I know, Adam, that uh, you've been uh, really excited about the idea of, of our guest tonight. Um, our guest is author 
Robert K. Wilcox. And, you know, growing, I've said this before, and I will always say this, is that uh, it is very clear when I do the show and I talk about religion and stuff, I do stay in the Christianity Catholic arena because that is what I know most. It doesn't mean that we won't venture into other areas, but it's especially around Easter. There is something about those uh artifacts and and those rituals and stuff that i find very interesting the one that i find the most interesting is the shroud of turin now i've been doing this radio show for nearly 10 years and i have never been able to find somebody who could adequately talk about the shroud of turin i actually there's a shroud of turin uh uh it's like an association affiliation or something out in colorado and i reached out to them many years ago and they're just like we don't think you're going to take us seriously. We're not going to be on your program, which is, I think, is a shame because that is couldn't be any further from the truth. Uh, so I think the timing, you know, it all happens at the time for the right reason, and that's tonight. And so uh, the book is called "The Truth About the Shroud of Turn: Solving the Mystery." It's available on Amazon, and uh, you know, even just going back and forth in email, we we're just talking about this, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm welcoming Robert K. Wilcox. Welcome to Ghost Box Radio. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. I am very glad that you're here. And uh, as we get closer to it, and, you know, that was the thing is is I, I couldn't, I was already starting to get overwhelmed with my own excitement to talk about it because, you know, I'd send you like things back in, I think I was trying to actually show you, Robert, that I, I did know what I was talking about a little bit when it came to like we're talking about the burn marks on the shroud and stuff through email. And you're probably like, I already said, I'll be on the show, leave me alone. And that's fair. But, uh, I really, I really <laughs> wanted to just, just be I didn't like, say that. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, cause it was, e happy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, uh, for those who may be unclear and, and, uh, it's very possible that, uh, that they are, uh, can you give us a quick overview of what the shroud of turn is, please? Yes. It's, uh, well, it's a 15-foot uh, length of cloth that was uh, wrapped uh, around a dead man who had been crucified. And uh, it's it wasn't wrapped like a mummy. It's wrapped uh, head to toe and back. And it, it gives you the, the impression of, uh, of both the front and the back of the man who was crucified. Now, until 1898, it was thought to be uh, just as kind of a stick drawing because on the cloth itself, when you look at it, it just looks like a stick drawing. Mm -hmm. But when they took the first photograph of it, that was the beginning of the Shroud of Turin and, and everything that we're talking about right now. Because the guy who took the photograph, his name was Secondo Pia. It was in Italy. It was in Turin, where the Shroud is. Uh, as they say, he nearly dropped the plate, his negative plate, because what he saw in his negative suddenly was a was a positive, yeah, uh, a, a real body in rigor mortis, a dead man who had been hurt the same way that the Gospels, that the Bible says that Jesus was hurt, uh, crucified, whipped, um, uh, crowned with thorns. But in certain different ways, not the way that we've always in, in envisioned it. For instance, the crown is not a wreathlet; it's a full cap of, of thorns, and it has uh, uh, it, it covers the whole head. and And the man's been beaten in the face, and uh, he's the the man is naked. Uh, yeah. But you you can't tell this because. He has his hands over his loins, uh, and uh, uh, it was just—it caused quite a, a, a tremendous, uh, 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 you know, yell out uh, throughout the world in 1898 because it looked like what is, what's going on here. And however, a a, a prelate, uh, a religious man—I I believe he was a a, a, a priest said, oh, no, this is, his name was Thurston, I think his name was. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, this is just a painting. And they, they, they put it away without, it, it, it died down. And uh, let me tell you, it is not a painting. Uh, 
subsequently, uh, more people began to look at it, and scientist after scientist began to look at the body, and they, they began to say, this is a real human body. They could identify these various things. Uh, there are blood stains all over it, uh, many, many blood stains. The only blood stain that seems old, though, after death is the one, there's a spear, just like the gospel says happened to Jesus. That one there is sort of an effusion of water and blood. Wow. So it began to look <laughs> uh, really like, I, I mean, the, it's, it's the amount of people who were, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I've just, I've just, I've just like, cause like you said, the spear with the water and blood, I mean, that is textbook gospel. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and, and yet it deviates from the, from the traditional, if uh, this cloth can be traced back to 1354, we have documents mm. that, that you can count them right back there. There's no question about it. Now, how does a 1354 um, uh, faker put a put an, uh, a, a, a negative image of a dead man on a cloth? It's that's that's really the beginning of the scientific mystery. There's no way he could have done it. Uh, no. Well, and and you know the thing is too, uh, you know, as you mentioned, as I read in the book, and the book once again folks, is called "The Truth About the Shroud of Turn: Solving the Mystery." The, in the book, you say yourself, you know, when back even in the 18, in the, the late uh, 1800s, when they're like, well, maybe it's paint. If it was paint and you could got into can call this thing back to the 1300s, that paint would have been gone a long time ago, wouldn't it? Well, that's a good point. Uh, but uh, let me tell you, there's no paint on this shroud. No, 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 uh, no. There, there, yeah, but uh, 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 nobody painted this thing. This is a this is a, a real photograph of a dead man, uh, a corpse in rigor mortis. Uh, there, there are interesting details to it too. Uh, he's been flogged and beaten. Uh, there are about 120 uh, whip marks on him, and Jeez. there was a little dog bone they theorize because something chipped out pieces of flesh out of it. I hate to get so <laughs> No, but it's nasty a, about it's it. It's important, but, yeah. Yeah, this is this is right out of a Roman flagrum, exactly what they did. He he has bruises on his shoulders, uh like someone who carried a cross. Uh and his knees too, the, right? Uh, re, uh, pardon me. And his knees as well, right? Because he kept falling. Uh yeah, there's there there are, are blood marks everywhere. everywhere. Uh I mean all over the shroud and uh uh, one of the most the most intriguing things to, to me is that all of these uh, blood marks they came first. The 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 image comes second. It's over the right. blood mark. Oh, overlaid. And uh, 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 there, so so we know that that the man was put into this shroud and he bled on it, and then the image came after it and. I'll just throw something out that's really interesting to me, but uh, all of the blood stains have, well, 95% of the blood stains have perfect borders on them. So I ask you, if the blood, as it did, dried into the cloth, so that if you have a blood, you, you've seen a clot on your own hand, yeah, it'll 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 clot right into the uh, the 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 uh, bandage that you have on your hand how did someone how could someone take the cloth off without ripping all these pieces of all these these blood clots that are all that 95 percent of them have perfect borders they do i mean they, right. they they're real blood say doctors you see the separation of serum and cellular mass in them and that's the way real blood behaves and once <clears throat> This person was put into this cloth. Why uh, it would have hardened? The blood would have hardened, and there's no way you could pull that cloth off of him to get the body out. So how did the body get out of the cloth? That's well, something that is. And to your point, I mean, I never really thought about this. I mean, if you look at anything that's bleeding, it's going to all all the all the blood. To your point all would would join together on the cloth and just 
like take over exactly. the cloth. Yes, exactly. It, it would make a, it would mess it would mess up every one of these cloths that are on here, and yet they have perfect borders. They're not messed up. Nobody pulled that cloth off of the body because the body it got out of the cloth in some way that uh, is supernatural, and uh, uh, I mean that's the implication here. So. I, um, I also like the fact, Robert, that, I mean, I guess this is a way whether, you know, and we'll talk in the next segment about, you know, who we, we think this person is, even though we're alluding down that line very strongly. But, you know, the the idea and reading from the book and stuff that, you know, you I take for granted is that this is a wake up call for a lot of people with, when they think about crucifixion, when they see that, that the nail, mar- the nails are not going through the hands are going through the wrist. They're not going through the feet. They're going through the ankles, um, which, which it makes exactly to us. It makes sense now because that's what, that's what supports that person on the cross, but everything that we've always heard. And I think it's kind of said in, uh, in, in the Bible, isn't it? That it was hands and feet. Yes, absolutely, and and you make a, a tremendous point there because, I mean, every depiction I've ever seen always puts the the, the nails through the hands, but the hands won't hold a, a person on a cross, and this man had his hands way way up above him. You can see from the blood flow throws flows they're they're going down the arm, and uh, they if you put your if you put the nails in the hand it would rip through from the from the from the 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 weight of the body yeah so where they put the the nail and where it is on the shroud of turin it's in a a, a space called destote space which is uh, above of the hand it's if you put your hand on your on your wrist and push down you'll feel it it's like a little hole mm. that's where they put the nail oh and, yeah these are realistic details that you that you just don't get anywhere else, uh, uh, especially in pictures of Jesus on the cross and so on. Absolutely. This is an absolutely fascinating conversation, and I'm loving every second of it. If you have any comments or questions, please put it into the comments on the Facebook Live. Let's do this. Let's take our first break. When we come back, we got a lot more to talk about with the truth about the Shroud of Turn. Our special guest tonight, Robert K. Wilcox. We got so much more to get through. You're listening to Ghost Box Radio on AM950. If you own a holistic or metaphysical business and are looking to expand, then you need to be listed on metamorphosisconnections.com. It's a network where you can grow with like-minded practitioners and reach new clients. MetamorphosisConnections.com is an online directory you need to list yourself and your business. Our platform makes it easy for you to create listings of your products and services, and you can also choose to list your classes, events, and so much more. MetamorphosisConnections.com helps you create weekly and monthly promotional ads targeted towards your potential clients and promotes them for you via social media and newsletter. There are clients searching for your specialty right now. Let us help them find you. Start your listing today so you can share your own unique gifts and talents by finding the level of membership that best fits your needs. Let us help you reach your clients that are searching for what you do. Visit metamorphosisconnections.com and sign up today. Need a stone to change your luck or break a curse? Try Larvikite, known for its hex-breaking powers. Need an herb to repel negative spirits? Try Rue, used to repel demons and jinn. Want to create a decoy so black magic can't touch you? Make a witch bottle. For more magical advice, visit Magus Books in Minneapolis. We've got the tools and the expert advice you need to succeed against the dark arts. Find us at 1848 Central Avenue Northeast in Minneapolis or at magusbooks.com. The Tilted Tiki, located in downtown Stillwater, helps you get your tropical tiki vibe on with a large selection of fantastic-tasting tiki cocktails served in unique and fun glasses, a menu of delicious food ranging from small bites, craft tacos, sandwiches, and more. Plus, don't forget they have live music Wednesday through Saturday nights. Located in downtown Stillwater, the Tilted Tiki is your tropical relaxation restaurant in Minnesota. Visit thetiltedtiki.com. Greg Bakken here. I've told you about the out-of-the-world roast beef sandwiches at Maverick's Real Roast Beef 
but I haven't told you about their Philly steak sandwiches, turkey, bacon, avocado sandwich, BLT, crispy chicken, fish sandwiches, brisket, or pulled pork. Okay, you get the idea. They make a lot of delicious food to the same standard as their famous roast beef sandwiches, and now I'm starving. I'm going to go to Maverick's Real Roast Beef off Lexington and Roseville, and you need to go too. Check out their menu at maverick'sbeef.com. So, Adam, what do, do I do? I finally get the the title of the uh, voice of AM nine fifty. I mean, it, that this, these breaks are all about me now. It really is, and that makes it really hard to edit this at the end of the night because <laughs> it's your voice wave like the entire time. I don't know. Did I get the vibe right on the tiki? You the did. tilted tiki. All right. Yeah, I, also, I really like the music on that one too. Oh, good, good. It was really nice. Oh, good, good. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, anyway, uh, welcome back to Ghost Box Radio on AM 950. My name is Greg Bach, and we're having a fantastic conversation tonight. We have on author Robert K. Wilcox. We've been talking about the truth about the Shroud of Turin. Uh, we've been talking about uh, just kind of the background of this, 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 uh, this, uh, this. What are we calling this, uh, Robert? I I keep wanting to call it like a cloak, a garment. It's none of those. It's a uh, linen. What what am I what am the I trying shroud, to say here? Yeah, the shroud of Turin. It it's uh, it is uh, a, a, a fourteen foot length of linen cloth. That's what I meant to say. It, yeah, it, it's in a yeah. That's it's linen cloth, <laughs> and it's in a herringbone um, type of uh, design, I guess, which is very uh what they had in jerusalem and around the middle east at, at 2000 years ago so uh that's another discussion is whether or not it's the the the, the right cloth but uh it is and and, and that um, was that was a big debate though wasn't it for a number of years because what and correct me if i'm wrong there was carbon dating done to the cloth but then they not grab samples mainly from the area that had been uh, that been fixed uh, exactly. in a fire. Exactly. Yeah. They. Uh, that was uh, that was a big deal. Uh, I remember I had written my first book, which was uh, published by Macmillan about the mm. shroud, and I, I was pretty much uh, believing, as I do now that the shroud is the real deal that it really wrapped jesus and it has evidence of resurrection but at that time uh it was a there had been a, a study on uh on the shroud they, they they were allowed some scientists a whole bunch of scientists called they called themselves stirrup i forget what it means mm -hmm. but they had uh, done a study of the of the shroud and had for instance, found there is absolutely no no uh, uh, um, oh what was it um, absolutely no breast no no, no uh, paint on it at all yeah. a, as a stroke you mm -hmm. know there were some some little mm -hmm. tiny little so anyway that was one of the things they had done and uh, then they they were asked to provide uh, this group of people who were really very anti-shroud people uh, with a piece of the cloth. And they gave them a piece that was off of the, the very end of the shroud. And uh, wow, uh, it was found to be in the 13th century or the 14th century, 1300 yeah. somethings, which is right when we could, could could actually put it back there and they got on TV and said the shroud is a hoax and so on and slowly it came to light that they had taken a piece uh, off of a of a patch <laughs> into the shroud which had that's what they had dated which did come from the what what's the 15th uh, or 13th century whatever it was sure. that, that they yep. had said that it was and that was uh, that they they folded into the in, into the woodwork. Uh, <laughs> they after, disappeared after. after that. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Now uh, I want to I want to talk about a couple things. There's I'm I'm and forgive me if I jump around a little bit because there's a couple things I want to kind of get to here. Um, sure. 
uh, they'll do my best to try to keep it coherent. Uh, so obviously, uh, does the Catholic Church recognize this as uh, Jesus's burial uh, uh, linen? Not officially, but does uh, one uh, guy next to the Pope believe it? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Do they haven't they haven't done it officially, but they've done so much for it now. Um, they've, they, they took it out of it. I, at one time I was the only, <laughs> I, I, I was the only person who had color photos of the shroud. No. And the reason was in 1973, I went to the, to the, to, to the, an exposition of the, of the shroud. They was, these were only held at great moments for the, it was owned by the King, not by the, by the church. Okay. And and I I got so close to it I said gee somebody could throw a, you know, a match on it and blow it up, but what I was getting to is they have now put it into a great uh, sealed vacuum sealed thing that nobody can get to because uh, the shroud has been through so many things in its history where it could have been destroyed but it wasn't but anyway. That was uh, I forget what we were talking about, but uh, uh, that they've put it into this. Oh yes, they've put it into this um, uh, cocoon almost now. Yeah, it, it, it has the airs and everything else, and that's so. The church, you know, in Rome now. And by the way, it's back. It was given back to the to the to the church uh, mm -hmm. about uh, ten years ago or something because. The uh, king of Italy, who owned it and had given it, uh, had, had had taken care of it. He gave it to the church. They are doing all of these things to keep it preserved. So the answer to your question really is, they're not putting it down on paper and and announcing it from the heavens and so on, but they really do believe it, and they realize that this could be the ultimate show of 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 truth of christianity so it, it's very uh, it's it's very interesting and and it, correct me if i'm wrong because i've never i've never seen it in person but if i if i am not mistaken that the uh that the the seeing it with your own eyes the the imprint of the man there is extraordinarily faint isn't it absolutely yeah yeah you you've done your homework there because when you look at it uh the closer you are to it the less you can see of it because it was it's this very subtle um uh darkening and lightening of of the cloth that makes the image and and that that says what what is really so interesting about it that that the image is made by a darkening or lightening of the fibers in the linen in an infinitesimal way there i mean it's each thread actually has many threads in it and each one of those is sin i don't want to say singed no they are affected mm -hmm. with color mm -hmm. either lighter or darker in a very minute way around each thread, which you and I couldn't even hold. Right. Something, something did to that. And, and nowadays, I think they're getting close to saying it was some sort of cold nuclear explosion, but that's a bad term to use. But there are such things as uh, that would, that would give this kind of, blast of heat or light very minutely that would make this kind of of uniform um uh impression or 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 or, or making so that you can see the the image in the in the in the negative and and it's also like and this is this is what's so amazing about it it, it's obviously a huge rush of energy that creates this imprint on this linen, in my opinion, the way I see it. But it doesn't, it clearly doesn't do anything to which you would think would damage 
the linen itself. The only damage that's come to it had been the fire cent you know, centuries later. So, you know, it's like it, it, there's something and, and I get your point when you say the word nuclear, where it's just like it, it kind of some kind of like instant flash that imprints what what's happening. Yes. Instant cold flash. Sure. And I was uh, I, I just recently was reading something about the shroud. And there are some people who think that that's what it is. I forget the name of of a cold type of 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 nuclear work but it has to do with something happening and it and it, and it, it could have done that but the, the the thing that is so incredible is how precise every one of these millions of fibers on the shroud are exactly uh impacted the same way there's yeah. a so it's even there's a, a you can make a 3D image out of uh, the Shroud of Turin. Now, that's one of those things with a, with a space-age type um, mechanism. It's called a VP8 image analyzer. That's the kind of thing where you can turn the Shroud around. You can turn the man in the Shroud around, excuse me, sure. and look oh, yeah. at him. I see and what you're he, saying. He has that, you can't do that with photographs. No. You can't do that with painting. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, and and so one of the things too, like it can't be lightning because it's well we don't we okay, I'm like it can't be lightning because I'm going off of my religious belief that uh, he's he's in a he's he's in some sort of burial stone, but we don't know. I mean, we would assume that regardless because that was the way it worked back then, but we don't know that for certain though, do we? Well, lightning would have uh, uh, destroyed the flow. It, That's it would true burn. as well. It, it, it would knock it out. Whatever did this, it, its power was was light, and I don't mean just light like you get from a light bulb, but I mean light. It's tiny. Its power was tiny in that sense, and I understand that in in some um, uh, atom type understanding that you can have that. Uh, in in a, a for lack of a better word a, a flash of that light sure it wouldn't it would be like cold light absolutely I do have a question from the comments here Richie B says is it a divine method that makes the image or scientific well that's how you want to look at it uh, yeah. in my opinion this is evidence of the resurrection yeah uh, so I tell you that it's a theological thing. But uh, it can, it, science has, has worked this thing over, and the best they can say is it's indecipherable. It's, it's unexplainable. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can take your pick. And I think it's interesting because I think that alone, um, and, and everyone's going to have their own opinion on religion or anything else, but alone, that piece alone is what can you, I think you can de de define as a leap of faith in a sense that uh, you can, you could be like, I choose to believe that this is what it is. And that's, that's part of what I think, sure. I think, I think there's a difference between religion and faith and my personal opinion uh, that, you know, you're like, I, and, and I'm actually, you know, Robert, just so you know, I'm right there with you. The idea of like that I choose because there, there hasn't been anything presented to me that makes me think otherwise. Exactly. Uh, listen, if, if this was the shroud of Aristotle, everybody would be on board. Right. This is a problem because it's a, it's a religious thing. But th listen, I've I, in in my book, you you it covers the the whole the whole gamut. But in the last hundred years, literally thousands of scientists have gone over this, and they just don't have a problem with it. It's real blood. It's a real body. We can see everything is 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 like that. So uh, it, it it it's we're definitely uh, the 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 burden of proof is now on the doubters. Absolutely. And and uh, Richie B has another question. I was kind of ask something similar to this. Uh, he says, so it wouldn't happen to your eye or any other human. 
And I guess my question, if I can kind of jump off of that, we've never found anything close to this ever, have we, to our knowledge? Not that I know of and not to our knowledge. No, I no, I, I, I've done enough research. There's nothing like this. There is nothing like this. Uh, it, it's, uh, as, I, as I said, you, you can make a 3D image out of it. Where does that come from? And yeah. this cloth is at least 500, 600 years old. And, and what, what I think people may not realize, I didn't realize this until much later in life, that all the pictures we generally see are the negative that actually gives a positive image. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, if you look at it in the positive, you see that stick-like drawing, and yep. it, it, it just looks bad. And, and you can kind of get confused, too. I remember being young and seeing it get confused by the burned corners, thinking that's actually part of the image, and it actually isn't. It's just burned, it's just burned from that fire uh, back in, in, in the uh, 14th century, uh, yeah. it, it's kind of it's kind of hard to uh, kind of differentiate. I was going to say also when you talked about it being put into that uh, uh, into that case uh, that uh, it was. I mean, they, I remember footage. It had what, what about twenty five years ago or something like that. That wherever it was for there was a fire there as well, and they had to break the case to get it out because it was in yes, danger that, yet again. That, that happened. Yeah, they they we almost lost the shroud. <laughs> About a hundred times, though, the, if you go back into history, that there have been many of those things. But yeah, they some guy uh, ran into the into the church and uh, opened it up. He burned his hands and everything, but he grabbed the shroud out of it. And about those uh, those uh, marks that look the, the the fire marks from yeah. the 15th century fire. Uh, the reason it's interesting that the shroud was always kept folded like you would fold a, a blanket yep. and so those uh, the fire uh, there was that there was a fire in in the 15th century and it singed the sides of that blanket at the corners yep. the four corners so they had to put patches in there and uh that's that's what you see on the shroud today you see those patches there and the, the patches were were the the, the ones that gave the the guys who wanted to say it was a phony oh yeah that, that gave it that 15th century now now I need to run off to break but before that I want to ask you one last question with the blood being on the shroud uh, someone in the uh, Joanne in the in the comments had kind of asked has that ever been figured out to what type of blood type that person in the shroud is yes it's uh B uh B A, I believe. Let me see. Do I have that around here somewhere? I think I do. It's A B, which is typical for Palestine. Oh, interesting. Yep. Oh, how incredible. Let's let's do this. Let's take our next break here. Uh, when we come back, I want to talk about where the shroud's been. I uh, have some questions. If you have any, put it into the comments. What a great conversation. You're listening to Ghost Box Radio on AM 950. Did you know that spiritual awakening is not all love and light? Surprise! Inner demons, ego deaths, and tower moments are on the horizon. But while life might hand you some harsh lessons, we've got the antidote to soothe your weary soul. Why not try a dragon's bloodbath? Or schedule a Reiki aura repair? With books, herbs, talismans, candles, and more, we put the Shazam in shadow work. Visit Magus Books at 1848 Central Avenue Northeast in Minneapolis or MagusBooks.com. Reach your highest level of consciousness and well-being with MetamorphosisConnections.com. MetamorphosisConnections.com is an online directory of the best holistic and metaphysical practitioners to help you make your most informed choices. You can search MetamorphosisConnections.com for classes, events, wellness and life coaches, plus metaphysical products and shops. You can also search for a wide array of healers from all modalities, including EFT, sound healing, energy healing, light therapy, ancestral healing, shamanic healing, reflexology, past life regressions, hypnotherapy, yoga, and more. And if you're not sure where to start, the search feature on metamorphosisconnections.com is tailored to help both those who know what they are looking for and those who are just starting. Come explore the possibilities for your higher self by visiting metamorphosisconnections.com. 
Their experienced practitioners can guide both beginners and those that are already on their spiritual journey. That's metamorphosisconnection.com, your link to direct you on your spiritual transformation. Car shopping is made super easy with Rudy Luther Toyota's Luther Direct. It's car shopping without ever leaving your home. Go to RudyLutherToyota.com and click on Luther Direct. Choose any vehicle in Rudy Luther Toyota's current inventory, either new or certified pre-owned. Then find out what kind of value you can get for your trade-in, review a payment plan you qualify for, and customize it. And then set up a time for Rudy Luther to drop off your new vehicle and pick up your trade-in. It's that simple. Your new vehicle comes to you without any of the hassle. Check out Luther Direct today at RudyLutherToyota.com. With your AM 950 weather, I'm Brett Johnson. Look for partly cloudy skies tonight with a low around 7, Thursday sunny with a high near 34, and Friday partly cloudy with a high around 45. And Kathy Griffin is returning to the stage with a brand new stand-up comedy show that comes to the Pantages Theater on October 11th. Pre-sale tickets are available now with a ticket link at am950radio.com. And make sure you watch AM 950 social media accounts for giveaway chances. And join me tomorrow on Ghost Box Radio with Greg Bach. And we're going to replay our interview with author C.L. Thomas. She talks about her book, Dancing with Demons, A Paranormal Encounter. Uh, it was a great conversation. Definitely one worth listening to again. If you want to, you can join me on Ghost Box Radio with Greg Bach and Facebook page at uh, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time tomorrow as we do our next edition of Myth or Mystery, which is our panel show with seasoned paranormal investigators and mediums as we take a look at uh, clips and uh, decide whether uh, what people had sent us these clips, whether they're paranormal or not. And a lot of uh, viewer voting is included with that as well. So definitely, uh, if that sort of thing is interesting to you, please check us out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, welcome back to Ghost Box Radio. My name is Greg Bakken, and we are talking about the truth about the Shroud of Turin. And I see some people in the comments a little unclear about what the Shroud of Turin is. Uh, uh, just we're not going to rehash it. Uh, certainly, please uh, take a uh, listen to the episode. Robert does an amazing job of explaining what it is, uh, but it is the burial cloth of of a man that has uh, their body imprinted, which uh, a lot of people, including myself, believe uh, could very well be the body of Jesus Christ, as uh, that those markings on there are very. Uh, very similar and very exacting, actually, to what has been recounted in the Bible when he was uh, crucified. So uh, that is uh, really where we're at with that. I got some questions, but in the comments, I have Carol, and Carol says, I truly believe it is the Shroud of Jesus, but I have what may be a dumb question. So can DNA testing be done? I think they are trying to do that, but the problem is the ancient, the the the, the uh, age of the cloth. I don't, I can't give you a perfect answer for that, but I believe it's it's in the works when they can get the right DNA situation. That's about the best I can do for you. Well, and and the thing is, and and. I mean, I, I'd love someone to prove me wrong. I don't think you can do a DNA testing because we don't have any other DNA of of what we believe is Jesus. So you can't. You, oh, so well, yeah. There you go. I don't. I don't think. I mean, to me, that seems like we can't. We can't put it up against anything else as an example. Um, so because DNA is a relatively new uh, process that had been introduced scientifically in our world in the 20th century. Uh, so, and, and that's, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, I think we kind of, I think a lot of us take for granted how long some of these things have been around. Like for example, fingerprinting had only been around, uh, since the early 20th century. So, you know, it's, it's, those are things that we just have kind of come accustomed to, I guess. Um, let's see. Uh, I think, so Sam in the comments was just saying that she was, I think getting it confused uh, uh, with, in the Bible about, uh, that uh, cloth that uh, Jesus that uh, someone uses to wipe uh, Jesus's face and his face is imprinted on that cloth. And uh, no, this is this is something different. But I mean, it just goes to show, Robert, how much happened during that time that leads to so many questions about what it is, which is why it's good that we have you on tonight. Well, there there is, by the way, a uh, cloth. Um, it's called the uh, cloth of uh, of uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it right now, but anyway, it's in it's in Spain, 
and it's been around since the sixth century, and they have taken uh, Oviato, that's what it's called, Oviato. Oh. Uh, Oviato, uh, and sometimes they call it the veil, but it, its history yep. goes back to the sixth century, and they say that it went over the face, and they have taken um, what Oviedo has. It's just a face veil, and they've matched it to about 50 different similarities, not, not only similarities, actual, the exact same kind of mark that is on the Shroud of Turin face. Now, it doesn't show a face. It shows blood. It shows massive amounts of blood. And what they've done is put it over the ridge of the, uh, of the nose, matching the two, the way it, it goes over the nose and so on. I, so that does exist. I see that. I did. I, this is new to me. And, and Sam brought this up in the comments. And so thank you, Sam, for that. The uh, uh, Sudarium of... Oviedo. Um, that's it. Yep. That's it. And I'm looking at it now and I, I get it. Wow. Incredible. That, okay. That's, that's the next thing I'm going to be looking at here. Um, you know, uh, so, and then uh, Richie had said we could match ethnicity with DNA, correct? And we kind of talked about that already, that, uh, uh, that uh, the, it, it matches uh, Palestinian blood, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, the, the blood type is from that area yeah. and, uh, there are also pieces of, of, uh, not vegetable, but uh, plants and so on that come right from the area of Jerusalem. Even, uh, I, I mean, they've made lots of matches like that. I thought that, uh, it, it was very interesting to note that, um, um, at the, wait a minute, what did I have here? Um, doggone it. I just had something here that I wanted to, to say that, uh, on the, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, the picture of Jesus in the, in the begin, in the first five centuries was of a young man, sort of, uh, Grecian looking, no beard or anything. Well, the shroud, its journey goes from, and there's a good, good way to do this, uh, right from the tomb. It goes to Edessa, Syria. And in five, 544, it's taken out of the, of the walls of Edessa, Syria. It was put there because Christians were being martyred and so on. Mm -hmm. And this, this, uh, what they called the Mandelian, which we think is the shroud of Turin, came out of it. And suddenly, throughout Christendom, the portrait of Jesus changed from that young child to the face we see in the shroud. I mean, long hair, mm -hmm. truncated mustache, uh, broken nose, the whole thing. Huge eyes, which are, are distinguishing in, uh, uh, in, in much of it. So it looks very much like uh, when that was discovered. Uh, in the sixth century, uh, the, the Mandelian, which we think is the shroud that suddenly, okay. and, and, and from there <clears throat> it was exalted. It was taken to Constantinople. The shroud was taken out weekly there, and then it disappears. Uh, and it's connected to the Knights Templar. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Well, oh the yeah. Knights. That was actually going to be my next question, Robert, about did the Knights Templar ever touch that thing? Well, that's there's a there's a lot of evidence that the Knights Templar uh, stole and didn't steal it, took it, took it uh, probably uh, in uh, uh, around around the 1200s when they when they took over the when the fourth uh, crusade went to Constantinople. That's where they we think the shroud was. They took it. It disappeared. And it surfaces in, uh, in, in, in 1354 in the home of a Knights Templar uh, uh, nephew. So that's the connection that you can make with that. But that's a, it's a pretty good, you can make a pretty good history all the way from the day they gathered 
both the the shroud and the the, the cloth that went over the head, which we just spoke about from uh, in, in the Bible. It talks about that. And then it goes to Edessa. It's found uh, in, in, in the Edessa city walls. <laughs> Then the, 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 the picture of Jesus changes, and it goes to Constantinople. Uh, it's taken by the, by the uh, Templars, and then it finally, uh, the history that we can, we can actually be bona fide, that we know of, we can trace it back piece by piece, is, is a, a Templar uh, nephew, I think he was. Incredible. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, when people find anything that's of, of value of any kind, the first question is, do we have any provenance? Uh, like we can we we hit back the li- the lineage of it. And it feels like that there's a there's a fair amount of provenance with with the Shroud of Turin. Very much. Very much. There, I didn't give you really. I mean, it would take a half an hour to go through all the little this and that stuff. But uh, you can take it right back to the tomb. And, and that's and that's that's incredible. I mean, that is truly incredible. And and once again, folks, uh, the book is called "The Truth About the Shroud of Turin: Solving the Mystery." Robert K. Wilcox uh, has written this. Uh, I have the Kindle version, which is what I'm reading right now. Uh, and I think this I, I think uh, this answers the question, so to speak, just by you saying that you can able to kind of uh, trace us back to the tomb. But uh, Richie asks, uh, I think narrowing the geographical area down definitely says a lot. But were there many people buried in this type of cloth, not the image, but the actual material was it used commonly is is what I'm trying to say. Uh, I don't know that. Um, uh, I, I presume since this this cloth is it was known to be uh, available in 2000 that maybe others would have used it. Uh, my my. My idea right now is that, uh, yes, you could put people in there. I myself went to Paris uh, thinking that I could find uh, 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 similar cloths. And I, I remember it was a great day. I went up, uh, this, this priest who was running the show on all the, on all, all, all the, the old uh, uh, stuff that they had there. Mm-hmm. And he came in and all we found were the the decomposition of bodies on these things you never found any kind of face or anything on it because the bodies deteriorated inside of the cloth yep the trout of turin is unique in that sense it it really is and it's it's uh pretty incredible I, the, everything about this is it just it 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 answers questions, but it opens up a lot more questions, doesn't it? About uh, because there's so much wonderful stuff that that we're that we're gleaning from this, and uh, you know, and and for me, the big part is it's like what what imprinted the body signature on this linen that has lasted for two thousand years. That's just right. so incredible. It is. I don't know. I think that uh, and, maybe and, it's. A- Maybe it's uh, a warning to all of us. Better get right. Better get. Better stop <laughs> doing all those bad things. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I would think so. I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I'm just kind of seeing if we got any more uh, questions here, and uh, we, we did answer this earlier. You mentioned it earlier, but uh, uh, Sam, I do think that uh, you should uh, definitely re-listen to the episode. But uh, the, the cloth once again is, is where. The Turin, uh, the Shroud, I should say. Oh, uh, it, it's now in Turin, Italy. It's it's in a, a, a special uh, casket, and uh, if you go to Turin, Italy, you can go to the to the to the church where it's kept. And you can see it. It's on display. It's and it's and it it's is. completely. It's like all fourteen feet are open for people to to kind of look at in this in this grand frame, right? I believe so. I, I have not seen it in that. It's, you know, I, I saw it, what, 30 years ago, and uh, there was nothing on it. I, I kept <laughs> thinking, some guy's going to throw a bomb at it. No kidding. That's incredible. Yeah. I, it's just incredible. I came, yeah. I, I, was, I, got too, I got so close to it because I'm taking pictures of it, and I said, how can I do this? Somebody <laughs> could, could burn it or something. And they, they realized that, and they, they – 
they stop that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I just think about the first time I ever even heard about the Shroud of Turn. This takes me back uh, a, a show called In Search Of. That's where I first ever heard of it with Leonard Nimoy. I don't know if you're familiar with the program back in the late 70s. And yeah, er sure. I remember that. Yeah, that's I've heard that. that's where I that's where I And it was it was a really very intriguing. But, you know, thank goodness, Robert, for books like yours, uh, because uh, this is. This is really, uh, really important. And we haven't, as, as, as Robert mentioned, we haven't talked a whole lot about a lot of stuff that's in the book. I mean, this is just a very uh, general overview. I, I have to say again, please, if you, this is an interesting subject to you, and I've been reading it, and I love it. Uh, the Truth About the Shroud of Turin, uh, Solving the Mystery, written by Robert K. Wilcox. It is uh, available on Amazon. I got the Kindle version. Robert, this was so great. Thank you so very much for uh, taking your time tonight and talking to us about this. Thanks so much, Greg. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, it's a, a worthy subject. It really is. And maybe uh, we can, once I read the rest of it, maybe we can find a reason to have you come back on and we can talk more. Sure enough. Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great night. We'll be back tomorrow with CL Thomas and Friday, Casual Friday. Take care, everyone. Hi, it's Matt McNeil. Listen to The Matt McNeil Show from 3 until 5.